TikTok. TikTok. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, over to you, Jack. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks, Nita, for the intro. Um, I'll just give you a, a, another couple of other things that I've done over the years um, that may be relevant. Um, I, uh, I as, as Anita said, I uh, founded and run Bloom Space, but prior to that, I set up a big incubator for University College London in King's Cross. And prior to that, I uh, launched and scaled a kids entrepreneurship education program, which I thought might be quite interesting to some of the year 10s. If you go to citrussaturday.org, you'll be redirected to the YouTube channel, which is still live. And it's got all the resources on how to uh, start your lemonade business and learn about how to be an entrepreneur on there. And you'll see pictures of me with a little bit more hair because it was a few years ago um, over in Africa and different countries launching those programs. Because I was very lucky UCL paid for me to go to some great places and, and launch that program, which still runs. So um, it doesn't feel like I've been doing this for 13 years, but I guess uh, it, I, I have and, and I've got the boldness as evidence. So. Um, uh, today is, is all about inspiring young entrepreneurs. We've got three um, three with us, um, really cool ones uh, for Worcestershire. And I think uh, it, it, what we're hoping to hear about is, is the business journey that you've had, but also um, how you've accessed the amount of support there is out there. And, you know, we've heard a lot about some of the later stage support that's there so that we can understand where this is headed. So if you're thinking about starting a business, you know, think about all these grants and big things that are going to be available to you once you've got going. And, and now let's hear the stories about how you guys did get going. So we've got a couple of minutes each to do intros and then I'll fire some questions. So Kaylee, would you like to start? Is that is that good? Yeah, that's fine. Um, hi, everybody. My name's Kaylee. Um, I run an Etsy shop. Um, so you may have read on the little bio about me on the leaflet. Um, I run a little shop selling handmade goods. Um, I brought some with to show you so you can have a look at what I'm on about. So I make fridge magnets um, all in kind of Scandinavian style because I'm half Swedish and I grew up with this kind of decor around my house. Um, so we have like some traditional Swedish horses and some Vikings which are new for me. Um, and I hand make them with clay and paint them with like Posca pens. Um, so you can see a little bit closer, I don't know if I'll focus. But yeah, so they're just a little bit of fun. They come from a, a very expensive traditional Swedish ornament and I thought I want to make them into little ones that people can afford to buy. So um, the way I got into it was um, last year, around when lockdown started, I actually got really ill um, and I was stuck at home at my parents' house um, for the time being. And um, I was really bored because uh, I'd watched too much TV, which I think we can all relate to. And um, my sister bought me some clay and she was like, oh, let's have a craft day. And I copied one of my mum's ornaments and my family were like, oh, can I have one? Can I have one? So I was like, OK, I might be onto something here. And I've always been interested in doing my own business, but never got round to it. Like I went to Joe's boot camp, which I highly recommend, really, really recommend to go there. Um, it helped me a lot and gave me a lot of good resources to fall back on when I did start my business. Um, and then I just kind of jumped into it. Um, I thought if, if I wait around and keep thinking, oh no, there's other people like me. What if people are better than me? And I don't have all the finance sorted. I don't know, I have no money. Um, I just kind of, I had to be like, right, okay. I've got clay, I've got paint and Etsy. I've just got to do it. A case of ready, steady, go, which yeah. is- Absolutely something I'd recommend. So Kelly, what did you study? Um, at university, I studied illustration and writing. Um, so I still enjoy writing. I do freelance copy, um, proofread, I can't be, proofreading and editing um, when I'm not making stuff. Uh, so that's what cool. I did at uni. And that was so about two years creative, when I graduated. Some of your creative skills there going into the business as well, which is mm -hmm. always good. Um, okay, so Imogen next, please, if you could give us a little intro. Hi, yeah. Uh, so I'm Imogen. I'm a Worcester a Business School graduate. Um, so I sort of started out more with an education in business, but I've kind of always been crafty. So it came about that way around. Um, I have a small business doing uh, patterns and kits for lingerie and sleepwear. So it's sewing patterns and sewing supplies that then uh, you're provided everything in a box and a kit to get you started. Um, it's a lot of 
sort of comfy clothes and nightwear and pajamas, which I think we're all enjoying just wearing pajamas a lot at the moment. Um, so I I started out through Worcester Business School. Um, I did a, a placement in my third year using Worcester uh, Worcestershire Enterprise placement, um, which got me in contact with Win and with how to sort of set up grant funding. Um, so it, it came about through the university more than anything, okay. I think. Okay, good. I think higher education is one of the driving forces in the UK for uh, entrepreneurship and uh, the starting of new businesses. Now, James, you've uh, actually got a role in the university. Um, so tell us about your business. Uh, uh, absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I started, um, my first business was in my final year of university, um, and I started a uh, lifestyle blog, which uh, whirlwind into something quite spectacular, getting all the way to the UK Blog Awards and so forth. James is looking inspired, but uh, <laughs> we'll see if he reconnects. Uh, he'll come back to us, I'm sure. Um, if, uh, Kaylee, perhaps we could go back to you. Um, if we go back in the same order. We'll return to James when he un unlocks. Um, I'm interested in thinking about the stage that you were at with in your life when you started your business. So what kind of age were you and what were you doing at the time? Were you, were you still studying? I've forgotten what you said. So at that point, I'd finished studying. Um, it's funny because I think my story is good. If you think that you're in a bad place to start a business, it might actually be the opposite. So I um, actually got diagnosed with Crohn's disease, uh, which is like a bowel inflammation disease at the end of 2019. And so I was on trying lots of different medications, felt really sick all the time, didn't have much to do. Um, and so I turned to like creating stuff, which is what I've always done. I'd finished with university. I couldn't work because I was too ill. So I was like, what do I do with my time and how can I earn money? Um, so that's the kind of situation I was in. And funnily enough, I think the pandemic, um, as awful as it is, um, did mean that everybody was interested and still is interested in making their homes a little bit more pretty, a little bit more um, decor, you know what I mean? So having a few little fun bits to put around um, is something that people want. So I, I, I think it was a mix of like accident and then being forced to by my situation. I've always been interested in starting a business because I'm, um, I'm chronically ill. So I, I have been for a long time and I've always wanted something that can fit around my schedule. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just perfect for that. Um, yeah. It, so this is going to this has come from you having a kind of a slight pressure on you to 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 have some sort of lifestyle business that fits around your lifestyle because you have chronic illness, and then an opportunity arising potentially around uh, the pandemic that people are trying to decorate their homes in a new way. And I think though that that's something which um, I, I see a lot with startups is that there's a, there's a little bit of pressure. To, to do something and and an opportunity and you see an opportunity and, and jump in as we you know really steady go yeah to, to and you've got to take it quick because if you leave it too much you'll lose confidence in yourself I well think. you can overthink it can't you yeah. that's the thing there's always a good reason not to do something you and can your first it. product is not always going to be good i think that's a really good thing to say very like, good my first yes. dollar hess i might have one yeah show us the prototypes i'll drop some things off my whiteboard it's very different from what I've got now. The paint is not as good quality. They're a bit messy, but I sold them. And, you know, I'm a little bit embarrassed <laughs> about what I sold at the beginning, but it shows people like them. To make those it's mistakes. Important. Yeah, important. Okay. Imogen, where were you in your life journey at the time you started your business? Uh, so I'd been, I'd had the idea knocking around, I think, for a couple of years at this point, mostly through university. Um, I was studying business, but I wanted to keep up doing creative things. So I kept designing and I kept sewing and I was working in a craft shop. So it was kind of there in my life. But it wasn't until my third year where I took the time out and did the placement because it, I, I made the conscious choice to sort of carve out time in my life to fit it in. Um, because I was doing the placement, I still had sort of my university, my student loan funding. I still had my sort of student halls. So it wasn't so much of a big risk at the time. Yeah. 
you lowered the risk there and, and the timing was right by the sounds of it. Yeah. But both starting your business is really nice and early on. So you've got a lot of time to develop them and you're doing it um, whilst you've got opportunities to sort of support yourselves around it. So that's cool. James, let's go back to you because you didn't get a chance to finish your intro. Um, Sorry about that. I, it came me off for some reason. I don't think Zoom liked me. Uh, I started oh, speaking and way. that was it for me. Um, no, just Jump to give in. you a brief introduction, then I don't know what you did here and didn't, but um, basically I started my journey in my final year of university, um, which I launched a online um, male sort of lifestyle blog, uh, which did incredibly well and sort of whirlwind into the opportunity of being headhunted into a marketing agency. Um, on the back of that, I then decided to launch my own marketing agency uh, back in sort of 2017. Um, and since then, we've sort of gone on to win uh, awards and work with some fantastic people. Um, it's been sort of a very much a process in building a business. Uh, and, you know, I think for a lot of people, you you look at businesses and you think it's uh, you kind of get to that end point. You think, oh, that's amazing. But there's this long journey before and it took a long time to get there. Um, you know, over the last four years, we've had natural ups and downs like any business. But it's been amazing to be able to get to this point. And now we're working with sort of everybody from airlines to celebrities to, uh, you know, big logistics companies abroad. And it's been a very good journey so far. Cool. So you all started at a similar kind of a point in your your lives, which is, is an interesting and sort of inspirational thing. I wonder, I mean, we talked a little bit about opportunities there and stuff. What were the barriers that you guys uh, encountered at, at the early stages of starting your business, do you think? What were the kind of the, the real barriers that actually actually sort of, um, caused you uh, to, needed that you needed to go overcome. Who would like to go um, first? Go on, I, James. I, you <laughs> jump in if you want to. Um, it was a lot of logistical things for me. I was right. living in student accommodation. I didn't really have the space to incorporate everything that I need. Uh, if you can see behind me, I've got sort of a mannequin and I've got rolls of fabric. There's about 500 cardboard boxes to one side. Um, <laughs> and I just didn't have sort of the, the space and the capacity to then, because I everything's packed myself. So I order in the rolls of fabric and everything's cut and packed into the boxes to, to be sort of distributed as kits. And it was just finding a place to be able to do that. I think we've got quite a lot of people in the audience who are thinking about or are starting craft businesses and businesses that are selling uh, small products and possibly some of them now be delivered. So particularly through stores like Etsy. And if, if you are doing all the fulfillment and delivery yourself, then yeah, you've got to think about how you actually, uh, what, have you got a big enough spare room um, to put it all in? Um, James, did you have something you were going to jump in with on, on the barriers there? Yeah, I think for a lot of people, you know, I, I meet people all the time with, um, that are quite interested in starting a business. Um, and these can be anybody from sort of last year of university, college, all the way to, you know, later on in their life and they want to start a business. And yeah, I get this question a lot, which is sort of, you know, how, how do you actually start? Like, you know, I, I feel like I don't think I can do it. And I think one of the biggest things, and I think this is something that you uh, reiterated in the beginning, Jack, which was the mindset behind it. I think for a lot of people, it's that sense of fear of failure that can stop you from building a business and it was for me at the beginning when I first started the marketing business I was so nervous to start because I was worried I was going to fail and I think it's quite an interesting thing because you already have this sort of you build up this barrier yourself that you're saying I'm going to fail before I even begin and you've there's no evidence that you're going to fail you've you've never tried it but you kind of build that stuff up and then you you know you kind of have that sort of anxious behavior that you end up saying things like well people will then know I failed or, oh, I, I'm not going to get there. I'm not like anybody else or oh, other people have done this before. And I think one of the biggest barriers for that was the mindset. You know, I started uh, hot sauce with nothing in the bank, you know, zero money, zero capital behind me. And I think a lot of people that are starting businesses, you know, there's that list of worries that they have. Um, but I think one of the most important factors is that to actually just try and I think it's not that failure is actually a bad thing at all. I've had two failed businesses before Hot Sauce. Nobody knows about that unless I tell them. But the point is that you have to actually try. And I think it's really important to take that first step without building up that barrier, that self barrier, because that's what can stop a lot of people. I meet people all the time with fantastic ideas. And they're like, oh, but I'm scared of failure. Oh, I need this. And it's that sense of but. And I think that's what can stop a lot of people. But I think it's really important to just try. 
Very, very much so. And I think the perceived barriers are never quite as great as, as you perceive them to be. Um, mm. And let's face it, we, we learn the most from stuff we, we, we fail at. So, you know, there's, if you can't, if you, if you never fail anything, you're not really going to learn much. So it's, um, it, it's, it's critical. Kaylee, have you got any barriers? I mean, you faced some challenges in your own life at the time when you were starting your business, but did you come across anything else that was sort of specifically uh, something you need to overcome? Um, yeah, I think um, kind of building on what James said and, and um, obviously that idea of like, I'm going to embarrass myself, everybody's going to see me posting and they're going to think I'm just trying to get money off them. You know, all those things you tell yourself and you think, oh my God, I'm going to put this like bad product up and people are going to think, oh, that's so bad. No, nobody thinks that, nobody's worried about that. And if they do, it doesn't, it, sh it doesn't matter, um, you know, because you're trying something and that's brave. Um, and it might fail, but that's okay. You know, it might do well, you know? Um, and I think also regarding not having any money, like I had clay that my sister bought me um, and I bought some special pens to paint on them. And then everything I earned, I put into not even a business account. I had like a separate Monzo account, um, which is like an online bank, just so it was separate from my other money. And everything I earned just went back into the business so I could buy more clay, better products, and then I just learned from other people. So the barrier was just kind of like, again, it's like, it's it's mindset thinking, oh, I couldn't possibly do this. But once you get over that hump, you start going and you're like, oh my God, I can do this. Um, yeah, I think yeah, one of the other barriers- <laughs> To different countries, big barrier, I wasted of, money on that. <laughs> logistical stuff then, yes. But I think one of the things that um, is important for all small businesses and anyone starting businesses think about how you might change what you're doing you know the, 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 you might try something that doesn't work fine you change it you're in control um, it's okay to change things it's good to change things so that, that's important I think the other thing is that, that, that a lot of people say oh I haven't got an idea for a business what I'm going to do well um, very 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 few people ever come up with a unique idea for a new business something that's genuinely new almost all businesses are an iteration, a development of an existing business or a simple copy. Nothing wrong with that. That's what most businesses are. So um, I think one of the barriers is, is this idea that you haven't got that, you don't have an idea for a business. Forget about it. Do, do something that someone else has already done because that's what most of us do when we start businesses. Now, you've got your businesses started and you've you've overcome the initial barriers, you've got some logistics out the way. Um, you've, you've obviously at that point got a brand. Um, how did you guys come up with your brands and, and sort of make those, how did you get them, get your personality into them and make them into a personality for your business? Kaylee, do you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, so my brand, um, because I make kind of Scandinavian themed stuff and my main product is a, a Dala Hest, which um, just brief background, it's a little traditional Swedish horse. They make them in a place called Dalarna in Sweden um, and they're made of wood and paint and um, it's like a free thing. It's just like a, you know, like a Kiwi for Aussies. I don't know, uh, not a good Aussies, but I got that wrong. Um, but um, so I just took that, made my own thing of it and made a logo of it and that's my logo and then for me I, I call myself Mo on all my social media you'll see uh, because that's a name given to me by other people and I just I like it it's a little bit different it's a little bit separate from me um, and like my copywriting and stuff it's just Mo is my creative me um, and yeah so I've just got the the simple logo and my product and it kind of just it just trickled over time I, I didn't start with like a really concrete brand I started selling stuff and then going okay let me add this let me add that and then it just built up over time into something that's interesting so again it wasn't a barrier to getting going it was something that you did along the way and you developed something that's personal to you and um, James your brand's very strong uh, tell us how you you you, you uh, created it um it looks strong now it wasn't in the beginning um uh, when we first started the agency uh I started basically, in a, and then about three months later, my business partner joined on with me and we wanted to get up and running because basically we landed a client very early on and we needed a name, business card, the works. And we came up with a logo um, pretty much in PowerPoint. And yeah, it's, it's bad now that I kind of reflect on that because now we sell branding and, and all that. But we came up with this logo literally in PowerPoint, which was a square with a star in it. And it said hot sauce and it was pretty much in times new roman 
And I now look at that a few years later and I, I, I try and sort of take it away and not think about it because it's, it's scary where we began. I think we were so um, forced to kind of get it onto the market as quickly as possible. We came up with something very quickly. Over the years, our branding has changed. We've become sort of a lot more bold. We now have colors. And I think it's quite an interesting question because for a number of years, I believed that a brand was at the bottom of my list of things to do. And, you know, we were driven by data analytics. We were driven by what we were trying to sell. And I think for a long time, I believed that a brand was, was irrelevant. You know, people would buy into, you know, who we were and what we sold because the proof was in the pudding. But only in the last sort of really the last year have we actually decided to spend time and effort on our branding. We've come up with a color combination, our fonts, and we've had that consistency. This has actually made us a lot stronger because now when we put social out and I put social out, there's that connection and people want that sense of consistency. And I think, you know, I've had this question before for small business owners that are predominantly selling on Instagram. You know, how important it is to have a consistent brand and have a brand and have a name and, and, and have a vision and have a look and feel. And if you'd asked me three years ago, I said, that's oh, not really relevant. Just get your product out there and try and sell it. Now, I believe that it's incredibly important. And I want to give you an example of actually how this works in behavior, which was we currently work with a magazine at the moment, and they have a consistent brand with their colors all the way through their Instagram feed. And the other day, they wanted a post uh, put out as quickly as possible, which was somebody with a watch a, at a desk and so forth. And it was a different color preset. And they said, let's get this out because it's the only photo we have. I said, are you sure? And they said, yeah, let's get this out. So we got this out and posted it. It was exactly the same photo from the same photo shoots as all the other photos, but it was a different color preset. And then only a third of people actually engaged with it. And it's interesting to see how humans relate to colors and they relate to the brand. You know, when we think of what we look, you know, when we're looking through social media, we're inundated with photos and videos and pictures consistently and constantly. And I think it's important to have that brand that stands out because you'll cut through all the noise. And I think if you can follow that through, it's incredibly important for the long journey that you're ahead, you know. Yeah, I think you're right. I think if you're going to build a business around a brand, it's, it, the consistency is the important thing. But I think the other thing you said about um, the fact that you kind of spent the first three years of business going, just cracking on with the business and, and having the brand in the background. I think something I've noticed is that actually getting a brand, getting a name in particular for the business, and then getting something for you uh, to, to give to people when you're talking about your business, a business card. Now, they're not expensive. You, you can get those very inexpensive. My, one of my first businesses, I actually just made them myself using some sort of kit. Um, that was a few years back. But now you can just order them online super cheap. And actually having that makes it real. So even mm -hmm. if your business has never sold anything and you're still at the idea stage, but you're pretending you're a bit further ahead, Having a card when you can go to a meeting or you can speak to somebody and you can give them that card, I think really starts to help you get into the mindset of actually being in the business that you're running and, and making it further forward. Imogen, you've got a lovely brand. How did you come up with yours? Thank you. Um, it was quite similar to Kaylee, actually. It sort of trickled through as I was as I was going along. Um, I made the mistake originally of, because I make clothes, of marketing it as a clothing brand, but it's not a clothing brand, it's a craft brand. And so I I made that mistake to begin with. And so it was learning that and adapting to what I was seeing in the industry because I was following some of the people on Instagram and on social networks. Um, and so having to change that sort of as I went along. But it didn't really come from anywhere in particular. It just developed, I think. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, isn't it? Because all three of you then have said about how your, your brands have developed. I launched Bloom Space with Bloom.Space, the new top level domain, the dot space, because it was kind of cool at the time. And Bloom is a truncation of Bloomsbury, where we had our first office. And it's now your space to bloom. It's your business space to bloom. Um, and that kind of worked nicely. And so, but again, we've morphed it over the, the four or five years and we've changed the strap line. So these things are intentionally i think developing with your with your business as you go along the, the so you, you've got your, your your little bit of pressure that's made you start your business you've got your idea you've got your first products out there and your brand and i think one of the other things that early stage businesses always struggle with in my experience of seeing other people is is pricing 
um, how do you know how to price your product? Um, I mean, if you're selling to a consumer, you can kind of adjust it a bit. But James, you were selling some of your stuff for B2B. What, how do you, how do you guys, James, if you want to start, how do you price what you do? Through trial and error. It's as simple as that. Um, I think, it, like a lot of people, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. If you're selling, you know, from lingerie to magnets to, you know, being an artist to, you know, selling something B two B or m machinery or even our industry, which is marketing and marketing services, a lot of it is through trial and error. Um, when we first started the business, we we did our work very very cheap. Um, and it was because we didn't have any clients. We wanted a portfolio of work behind us. And it was very, very hard to price up our work. We originally did it on the uh, time, basically uh, money equals time. And then that time was then presented to the client. And then the client would say, yeah, or nay. As the business grew, we look back at that and had to change our pricing. We have changed our pricing. I think at the beginning, a lot of people will have their pricing slightly lower to get into the market. But it was funny, I, I spoke to someone the other day, um, it was this local artist, and um, she showed me her work. And we were discussing her work back and forth. And when I was looking at her work, I said, you need to raise your pricing. And the artist looked back and said, well, why do I need to raise my pricing? I, you know, I feel quite comfortable. I don't, I don't want to go to that person and ask for more money. But it sometimes takes that external person to look at your work sometimes and go, you need to raise that pricing. It's too good to be that cheap. And, you know, it was quite ironic we, throughout lockdown. We had an, uh, an, a client that we worked with in our first six months of having the agency. He called me up. He said, James, I really want a new video for my social media. Can you do it for me? I said, yeah, of course I can. I hadn't spoken to him about three years. And he came back and he said, yeah, can you do it for this price? You did that price for me when you first started. And I was like, what? No, it's like four times to say the price now. And I felt kind of rude saying it. I was like, no, I'm, I'm not doing that for that cheap. But you kind of have to relate your your work and what you do to your price. And I think it's incredibly important. You know, there's that joke I've seen online where someone goes in and they say, can you go fix my iPhone for me? And it, and he says, it will take a hundred pounds or cost you a hundred pounds. And he goes, oh, you know, you only worked in it for 10 minutes. He goes, well, I've gone through training and everything to charge that. So it is done in 10 minutes. And it's the same for any industry. If you look at Kayla, you look at Imogen, you know, you, the, the work that goes into this, you got to price all that up and the more popular it is the, the higher the price you can get to a point where you're comfortable but i think it's also it, it's important for trial and error though sometimes you have to understand your market and you have to understand what your audience are willing to buy it, i think that's very true and i think it, especially if you've got like a think about the audience with the with the craft businesses and food business fashion business things like that you've got a lot of ways of comparing what your price could be to, to what exists in the market and so i imagine that that imogen and kayla you did that but do you want to tell us a little bit about you know how you came up with your pricing because you've got material costs as well as your logistics costs to factor in you got to actually buy the stuff to make the things with so tell us about that kayla do you want to go first yeah, sure. Um, so for me, um, it's it was about market research. So looking at other similar items, seeing how much it cost, and then just factoring in. There's like some simple calculations you can do. There's so much online. And I've put some in a little tip sheet that I think Anita is going to send out um, if you want it at the end, um, because it's hard to explain in person. But it's just kind of like material costs, time it took you to make it. Um, what else is available, how's yours different um, and you have to factor everything in and then put a price on it and then um, as James said trial and error see if it works um, you know if it's really expensive no one will buy it but if it's really cheap no one's going to value your product and I see that a lot with um, artists they'll give stuff away for free um, and stuff like that and it's like but then but then you're not valuing it yourself so why is anyone else going to value it um, so I think that's an important thing um, for pricing so just looking at other people's stuff and then asking other people so I'm in a lot of like Facebook groups um, with other people who sell crafts and if I'm really stuck on one where I'm like I don't know if people are going to buy it for that I'm not sure I'll post a picture of it and I'll be like guys what would you buy this for and that's just simple quick research you can do um, for that that sounds that does sound cool and I mean it you know there, there are poll, poll tools on all the different social media platforms now 
to, to, to give you those information points. And then of course, when you actually start making some sales and you realize that your price is, is, is certainly affordable, it starts to give you more info. And just on that specific point about market research, something to, to sort of highlight is that, you know, this talk is all being arranged by the British Library Business Library Center and the network of these around the country. If you do want to go and deep dive into research databases, that's the kind of thing that's available in those uh, in those IP centres, so have a look at what there is in the, in the libraries um, once they reopen, and, uh, and 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 you know it's a good place to start with market research. I did that years ago with a previous business, and it was um, it was effective. Imogen, how did you price your product? Uh, so similarly to to Kaylee, there's sort of uh, physical costs you have to add in, and so you, you work out the physical cost of the product. You also have to think about um, how your costing things like postage, um, you're costing um, any like website hosting, things like that. You, you mustn't just think about costing the product. You also have to think about the cost of the business that you have to meet as well. Um, but in terms of costing your time, that's, that's a big one. Um, because although you've, you've sort of made enough to, to break even, if you like, what are you earning from the business? Um, and actually, it was a really helpful tool I picked up from the, the business boot camp I did through the uni. Um, they, th there's an exercise that really makes you think about um, what it is that you need to be earning to be able to live from this business and how, how you factor that back into uh, costing individual pieces. I think that's really important, isn't it? It's, you can sit down and work out what it costs to buy all of the raw materials and um, the postage costs and packaging costs and all those sorts of things, and then work out whether um, you can break even on a sale. But of course, you've actually got to make some money. It is a business and it's got to make some profits to pay you for your time. So yeah, working out what you need to live off and then working backwards from that is always a good way to start. Um, it's one of the things that we did um, with the Citrus Saturday program and, and, and making lemonade, it was a nice, simple business. Book. You think how much do I want to make, and then how much do I need to sell the lemonade for? Because uh, it's easy to work out what push you make it. So those things are, um, uh, are important, I suppose. The, the, have you made any kind of big blunders when it comes to pricing that you want to share with us that you'd be comfortable sharing? Has anyone done that? I definitely have. I postage man I mean I've made so many mistakes you look up and then it changes over time and I did this thing in, in around Christmas I designed a mug uh, to sell as part of a gift set but you could buy the mug individually and it was around 10 pounds um, and I'd forgotten to change my postage on that item I still had it as if I was sending a tiny thing so I ended up basically sending uh, a mug to America and paying for it rather so I just made a loss on it just a, as an individual mug but I learned really quickly from it but that was a big mistake I learned from. <laughs> Thankfully it wasn't like a Groupon thing where you sold 30,000 of them. And <laughs> now, uh, Imogen have you ever done that? Have you, have you found that you're uh, you, you didn't factor in the cost of the size of the house you'd need because you needed a spare room <laughs> to put everything in? There was that one. Um, Postage uh, wasn't so much of an issue because everything, all the boxes are designed to fit through letter boxes. Everything is designed like that. So it, I kind of have that benchmark and it's always there in the back of my mind that it has to fit with that. Um, but I think I touched on it before was forgetting to factor in things like the price of the website and the point of sale system that I'm using because I pay a monthly subscription for my point of sale system and forgetting sort of those yeah, kind of costs, costs I think yeah. yeah stuff that aren't that maybe they're annual or they're they're kind of a back like your yeah. broadband or something like that as a cost so it, on that topic I think one of the things that a lot of people kind of worry about and think about perhaps in reverse order they think a lot about the finances before they think about the business is, is managing those finances um how do you guys go how do you manage your finances do you, do you have an accountant do you have uh, you, you, Imogen, you mentioned you've got some software. What do you use? Um, so one of the biggest helps for me, uh, Simon talked about it, was I'm the current Make It Happen Challenge winner, um, which one of the one of the sponsors in that challenge was an accountant. Um, so you you get an amount of their services as part of 
the award and so he helped me set everything up so I've got it's QuickBooks I'm using it's the sort of online software um a lot of spreadsheets just mm -hmm. a lot of numbers <laughs> but you can do it fairly easily with spreadsheets when you start yeah. aren't you? And, and and actually especially a very early stage business um you don't really need to worry too much about software or accounts no. I know whether whether James or Katie whether you did that when you started but I know I did with several spreadsheets and things and then you sort of they get a bit unmanageable after a while and then you transition but how did you guys do it um, when I first started, we did everything very old school paper, literally paper invoices, the works, and it was the worst thing I'd ever done. It was such a bad system to have because we worked on a lot on a retainer basis with a lot of our clients and they, we ended up just missing invoices and missing, you know, checking when people were paying. And because a lot of it was on a 30 day basis paying, a lot of people were overdue and because we weren't reminding them we were losing money. One of the biggest uh, benefits when we first started was we hired an accountant straight away that was referred to us. And that was one of the best investments I've made because I don't look at finances. I can't, I don't understand them half the time. So I'm like, I don't, I don't know what this is. So having an, an accountant makes uh, things a lot easier. And the second person we hired was a finance officer, someone that was actually in charge of doing all the invoices. Because I think like anybody, especially in my industry with marketing, it can be hard to be so nice to a client want to give them all the love and attention you can and then be like you owe us money and it, it like it breaks that sort of like weird relationship so you kind of have to be very careful so and i remember we worked with um, these people in the beginning who worked with the nhs and you know you have to be so nice in marketing and you know it was really it was the lovely people we worked with but then they didn't pay on time and ruin the relationship you see so we hired a finance officer and that was her that's her job to deal with all the finances and it's incredibly important but for small businesses things like quickbooks is a i use it religiously um and i think i would advise a lot of people when you start making money to use something like quickbooks because it does allow you to uh, manage everything um but again though you know especially in the craft industry i can imagine that you know you guys will do things slightly different to us because we have sort of fixed costs so i imagine that if you have custom orders those costs can change um but for example for us a lot of our costs are very similar so we can be very specific in what we charge um but in our industry because we only invoice after the work is done it can be a little bit harder for us because we have to waste money in i don't know if it's in, in kayla imogen please correct me if i'm wrong but people pay for your product before you ship it out to them, I imagine, you know, just in case someone's like, I don't feel like paying now. So, but with our industry, it's the opposite. So we have to be very, very careful. Um, but I would say that, yeah, a finance officer and accountant was one of the best things I can advise. And I imagine though that the BIPC and Worcestershire County Council and then WIN and stuff, you know, there, there is that information available to talk to people in finance because it can be so daunting starting a business and making money and then going, I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know if I'm making money or not. And if you haven't had a business background, it can be even harder. So I think it's important to have that support that, uh, you know, like Anita and the people are offering. So you can go back to them and say, I'm very confused what I'm looking at here. Can somebody help me? So yeah, that's what I would do anyway. Yeah, and I would definitely recommend getting um, an accountant once you are starting to make some money because you do have to pay them. So um, you do need to have some money in there making some sales to be able to do that but uh, I think you're, you, you're, it's interesting you pick up the point about bill chasing because I see a lot of small businesses and they spend a huge chunk of their time actually build, bill chasing and of course that time has to be paid for so the clients then that you're bill chasing you have to make sure that it's incorporated into their bill the time that you take to actually chase the bill and I have a, a, a top tip from a friend of mine in London who runs, runs a design agency and he has a member of staff called Debbie and Debbie has her own email address and her own personality, and she sends out all the bill chasing emails. Of course, there isn't anyone called Debbie, but it, it, she, uh, Debbie, uh, does all those conversations that would otherwise lead to that breakdown in uh, in the relationship with the client. And so that's another way of doing it. But Kaylee, did you did, did you have a, an experience around around that? Um, first of all, I love the idea of Debbie. <laughs> I'm definitely going to be using that at some point. Um, yeah, I mean, my business is still quite small um, and just from the beginning, I would just say if you are just starting out on something like Etsy where you're just selling individual products um, and you're not earning enough to 
get an accountant or do anything like that. Just make sure your money is separate. So I have the Monzo account. My stuff goes directly into that. And Monzo is pretty good. I think Starling Bank is another good option um, where it's an online bank and it will show you each month your outgoings and ingoings. So just make sure you purchase your um, uh, stock and things like that through the same account. And then every month you've already got an ingoing outcome, outgoing and you can kind of see a profit um, or a loss and what you're making. So just keep a general track of it. And then when you're big enough, you can kind of move on um, to totally agree. I think that's things. a great, great way to start things off. Don't use your personal bank account. Look at, yeah, Monzo, Revolut's another one that's good for that. Starling Bank is, is excellent and tied. Um, they're all app based. You can open an account in a few minutes. Forget the high street branches. Don't worry. Don't, don't bother. Go to the one of the, the challenger banks that you can use an app for. Set up a separate account. Then your bookkeeping is done by the account itself. So yeah, that's a good tip for the early stage businesses. Images. I was just going to add something on to, to bank accounts. Um, don't feel in the early stages either that you need a business bank account because there are costs that come with that. Yeah. They'll start charging you per individual sale and things like that. So just like Kaylee's done, having a separate bank account. Just make it just to keep, keep it separate. separate. It doesn't need yeah. anything fancy. Cool. And so you guys, you both sell on, well, you all sell online, but they, they, where did you sort of, uh, tell us about the journey to your first customers and how you kind of then nurtured those relationships with your first customers and, and grew it from there. Maybe Imogen, could you tell us a bit about that? Um, so yeah, so I sell online predominantly through my own website, but I'm also on platforms like Etsy, um, so part of that community. And I think, from memory, I think my first sale came through Etsy. Um, I joined, uh, I think I said this to, to Jo at the time, I think she might have been in the room. Um, when I set up the website, it sort of took me a couple of weeks and I was getting everything ready and together. I hadn't launched officially. Um, and then you sort of, you press all the buttons and you set the website live and then kind of nothing happens. It's very anticlimactic. Um, <laughs> but I think the sale actually came in through, through Etsy and I joined a few of the local communities, um, sort of the Worcestershire Etsy platform. I live in Birmingham now, so I've joined the Birmingham one. Um, and it was someone I'd met at one of the community meetings. Um, Tell us more about these uh, regional, uh, the, the, the Worcester Etsy platform and the Birmingham uh, one. Kaylee might be able to jump in as well. I don't know if you're in, in the groups. That'd be cool, yeah. Um, so with Etsy, they have, every region has its own little group. So you're still on the main uh, platform, but it's a community of people who are doing the same thing in your area. So we used to meet up pre-COVID. We used to meet up at the cafe at the cricket ground uh, once, a, once a month. Um, and then every year they have a craft fair for Christmas. And that was at the old porcelain works. So that was a lovely way of meeting similar people in the area if you if you don't know people who are around you because we'd just go and we'd drink coffee and we'd just chat about the issues we were having and what kind of things were coming up and there's always a, a regional leader so she sort of gets things through from Etsy like postage laws that are changing or what you have to do to get to work with free delivery in America or why the algorithm has changed this month. So it was really helpful to sort of start. Fantastic. Kaylee, did you find the same? I actually, I know of the Worcestershire Etsy group and I spoke with them a little bit around Christmas, but at the time I didn't have um, enough different products to be part of their online Christmas fair. So I'd love actually if Imogen, you could put me in touch maybe with them because I'd love to I love join it. in. I think that'd be really <laughs> useful for me. Um, so I think yeah, so this I is an important, fun this is an important thing is is that when you start your business you sort of you, it's very much you looking at your business and sort of looking at it inwardly and then you start thinking about customers doing it outwardly. but but it's a very lonely thing um somebody said this earlier and it can be uh there can be lots of things you think oh gosh i don't know how to do this i don't have that but, you know you've got to do everything yourself you have okay there's lots of people that can help you some of them are here in the in the meeting but there are these support groups and kind of community groups and groups that are meetup groups, all these different things that you can you, you can access. And I really highly recommend it. In this area, there are loads. And I'm sure, James, you've probably been to loads of the kind of networking stuff that, that there is out there. Um, tell us your experience of, of going to those sort of those those meetups. Um, 
there are some great networking events and there are some bad networking events. It's as simple don't as that. Don't have to name them. It's um, up to you. No, no, no. I, I, as this has been recorded, it's probably better for That's me fine. to not. Um, one of the best networking events I ever went to was Win. Hands down, I can say it from you know bottom of my heart. I'd been to so many when I started the business, and you know I went to some early ones, breakfast ones. I've I've been to them all, and I think you know my business partner at the time said, "Look, get out, go and go and see people." And I was like, "All right, fair enough." So went out and did a lot of this, and a lot of networking groups. Some of them just didn't work, and it was it didn't work because it wasn't that they were bad. It just didn't work because of my business. The last people really want to you really want to speak to a lot of the time are, are accountants and marketing and you know we're right up there with will writers you know and i think unless you need our services you don't really want to talk to us and i don't blame you for that so i did a lot but when it was um simon actually that offered me to come and go to one of the win events and hands down they were fantastic they're just a very different approach i think with networking events that you have to find what's good for you and what isn't you know I think with with the win events, people were very much it was relationship building. I've been to somewhere it is literally very critical. Who have you referred this week? And then you're like, whoa, you know, and it can get very hostile. So I think find out what works for you and what doesn't. I think that's the most important. You know, again though, online networking groups as well. Um, some of them are great. You know, we even built our own networking groups because we eventually wanted to find local people that were kind of on the same wavelength as us. Um, but it's finding out what works for you. And I think, you know, just seeing this connection right here between Kelly and Imogen saying, well, I'm now ready to join that networking group. That's that's amazing. That's the kind of thing I want to see. Um, so I think it's just about discovering what works for you. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think it's definitely worth trying as many as you can stand going to. And then you find the ones that, that work for your business and that you like. I mean, Bloom Space, co-working space, we've got loads of businesses here that we have that share the offices here. And it's remarkable because some of those 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 meetups are really unpopular, but then you find there's a subset of people who love them. They're absolutely mm. perfect for their business and they work and they get the sales and they love and they enjoy going. And mm. then you get the other the, the other flavor where they say, oh, those ones are a waste of time. And it's so important to to find the ones that, that suit you. It's your business, you should enjoy doing it, and the ones that are effective. Um, there are a whole range um, and and you know if you can't afford to pay for them go for the ones that you don't pay for and if you move up the, the the income spectrum and you want to pay for some go for those but you know there are definitely a lot out there to, to access win it's all funded it's all eu funded it's a it's a fantastic resource make use of that one as a starting point and also look for your local groups there's a great one in morgan hills the, the business forum so i think uh, that sort of um kind of it, the idea that you should be enjoying running your business is, a, is an important thing you know this isn't something that you do working for somebody else where it might be a bit of a pain in the neck so that, which let's face it is why most a lot of us start our businesses because we we find that we're mm. not the most effective staff members in other people's businesses um i'm talking about from a personal perspective here so uh, if we maybe you guys could just reflect on some of the stuff you've really enjoyed about starting and running your businesses. Uh, Imogen, let's start with, with you. Um, the biggest thing for me, I think, was uh, crafting. Um, because I wasn't, I wasn't doing it as my occupation. I was a business student and I was sort of working and I do a lot of work with social media. That's kind of my day job at the moment. Um, so it was, yeah, it was just a really nice sort of craft outlet. And so it so was a it was creative really outlet thing. for you and something yeah. that you personally enjoy spending your time doing. Really important. It's being able to make that hobby pay for itself or then start to pay for your life. It's wonderful. I would imagine, yes. And, and Kaylee, I guess it's, it's sort of similar. Yeah, it's a similar thing for me. I love being able to actually use um, my skills um, uh, and my creativity and actually make money from it um, and then also just on the um, the side of like just bringing people a bit of joy like I get messages like oh my you know my auntie's in from Sweden I want to send her this or I usually get a lot of expats who are my customers so people who've moved here so people like my mum 
um, who are living in the UK and want like a little reminder of Sweden in their room. And I love that. I love having a little chat with them. And that makes me happy um, that I'm just bringing like a little bit of joy. Uh, and do you, you, do you get that feedback from your customers all through the, the Etsy platform, do you? Usually, yeah. Um, or I'll get a message on social media sometimes. Mm. I would say I get most of my customers through Etsy. Etsy is quite good. Um, if you know how to use the platform, which there's a great handbook on the actual Etsy website on how to um, optimize your listing. Um, but m most of my customers through Etsy and they'll send me a message or when they make an order, they'll pop just a little background for me and say, you know, this is for my mum, this is for my auntie. A lot of them are bought as gifts. Um, I imagine that that customer kind of relationship side of it is, is is really nice, and I can imagine James with your company. I thought that you know really doing everything that you can for your accounts and for your customers is is probably something that gives you a lot of pleasure. But tell us more about what you enjoy most. Yeah, I think um, I think like a lot of people, when you start a business, you're starting a business for you know, the two reasons: a passion has driven you, or that you want to do it yourself. Um, when I worked at the agency beforehand, I felt that it was very hard for me to wake up in the mornings and I didn't want to actually get out of bed and I started living for the weekend. And I think a lot of people are in this situation as well. So one of the big things that I loved when I, you know, and I still have it to this day is that I get up very early in the morning and I start work and I start work straight away because I want to, not because I have to. And I think that's a great feeling if that passion drives you to start your day. And I think that's really important. So, and, you know, I love... I love showing my clients what we can do. And, you know, we've had some amazing results from clients and, you know, we've had some lovely testimonials. Um, and it's really nice to be able to have that sort of um, connection and build that brand with your client. And I think it's, it's really beneficial. And then on, on the other spectrum as well, I know it sounds bad, but it's also nice as well, kind of proving people wrong. I mean, I think we've all had someone in our life that's kind of said, this ain't going to work for you, you know, and, Mine was actually one of my uh, high school teachers who said, you know, you ain't going anywhere, James. And then they invited me back to the school to do a speech. And it's, ah. a, it's a nice feeling. I'm not going to lie. And I think, you know, like a lot of people, you do meet people that will put up those barriers for you and say, this isn't going to be successful. And yeah. you've got to overcome that. And when you do, that's a really good feeling. You know, and I, so it's on two spectrums of, you know, doing something you love and also doing, you know, proving people wrong is a nice feeling as well. And, and another reason I think people sometimes start businesses and then grow them is because they, they, it, it's about employment and about creating employ, employment opportunities. James, tell us about that with, with Girls Your Business, because am I right in thinking you've got, you've got a team now? We do, yeah. Um, so you were talking about Debbie. Let, let me tell you my Debbie which is my mum. My mum joined the business about a year into the, we were doing it and she did it because basically my business partner and myself, we were doing awful finances to the point where we just weren't invoicing at all. We could have called ourselves a charity. Um, anyway, my mum said, right, I want to come on. I want to fix your finances for you. So she did. And my mum's brilliant at it, you know, and I don't give her enough credit because she is the Debbie. She will be on the one that will call clients and be like, I'm calling, you know, it's time to pay up and it, you need those sort of people. Um, so, you know, we started out like that and, you know, we do have a team of people behind us now, you know, recently we've just started going through the Kickstarter application process to hire another person. Um, but we, you know, we hire social media people, web developers. We very much live in the, um, this ethos that you don't need to have an office. I do a lot of stuff from, you know, my own room, the garage, wherever I am. I did, I did a social media campaign from the co-op car park yesterday because I had time between a meeting. And I think I, we very much work in that ethos of actually that you can work from anywhere and that you have a team, but also make it fun for them as well. Having a nine to five and restricting them will not make it enjoyable. You know, so our social media team, they don't work from offices at all. And I think it's really important to have that uh, because they will also be motivated to work as well. Brilliant. A lot of responsibility there employing your first few staff members, particularly if one of them is your mum. So yeah, um, thank you all for those um, those uh, journeys through your business. Um, Anita, uh, thank I'll, you, I'll hand back and shut up. No, no, please don't shut up. Um, hi, Jack. Yes, thank you. We were getting some questions um, in the chat. Um, I hope Ear 10 can, help, can, can hear us now. Um, 
with Mrs. Hill uh, in the classroom. They're asking what the scariest thing about starting a business is. Does anybody want to take that? Who wants to uh, launch into that one, James? This, w the scariest thing for me at the start was failure. Yeah, and I think it is for a lot of people. I think it's that, that's, that point before you jump. And it can be a really scary moment to kind of say, if I start this, what happens if I fail? Um, I want to just give a very, very brief uh, um, example of why it's important to jump sometimes and take the risk, which was I met a guy the other day called Matt. And over Christmas, he wanted to start a business in the football industry. And he had these accounts that did incredibly well. And he said, I want to start this into a business, but my parents say I shouldn't. And I said to him, just, and it was after a lecture, I said, just have a go, see what happens. If it fails, it fails, it doesn't really matter. And on Boxing Day, he made just over 10,000 pounds of sales. Now, that's how important it is to jump sometimes. You know, I, I, failure is a really scary thing. And I think it's scary for a lot of people starting business. It doesn't matter how old or young you are. But it's that important moment to kind of say, might as well have a go and just try. Thank you very much, James. Um, we've got a question from S. Surias. I don't have your full name. Um, he's uh, or she is asking, what if I know nothing about um, business? Where do I start? Um, that's a hard one because I think for a lot of people, you know, sometimes that you do have a business background when you start. What I will say this though is, if you don't have a business background, you want to start a business, message me and we can have a chat. Simple as that. I do it with a lot of people. If you, if you have an idea, you want to start a business and you're not sure where to go, let's have a chat. Simple as that. Reach out to me on social or anything you'd like and let's see what we can do. And again, there are so many support groups. You know, you've, you've heard them today from everybody from the enrich program that i've been part of it's absolutely brilliant run by joe you know from everything from the bipc to worcestershire county council the win there's groups everywhere and there's people that have gone through your journey so if you haven't had any business experience it really doesn't matter you know i totally it's agree with that. To try. i think it, I, I think talking to people is the, the key thing but also another one is to look at other businesses just look at examples of businesses and how they work just do some googling think about businesses that you interact with think about what businesses you like buying from and experience about what how you the ones you enjoy the experience of work with and then look at how they work and, and start to yeah go and ask other people how they work ask the business owner how it works i'm sure they'll tell you they will yeah. thank I'm you just add in support groups is is the the key place to start even if you're just on facebook and you find a relevant Facebook group there'll be someone you can ask absolutely and I'll share everyone's contact details after the session so you can contact any of the people on the call today um, I'm sure everyone will be happy to help um, we've got another question from Gwyn and she's asking how do you move from sales um, by your family and friends to getting sales from the general public struggling to get customers um, what are you selling Gwyn are you are you on the call still do you want to unmute and tell us a little bit about your business hi yeah so um i sell handmade candles um beeswax candles that i make from home um they've been really popular with friends and family and people i know um but i've done some local marketing and things and just had absolutely no sales from sort of people i don't know so i'm really not sure where to go next to move it forward can I jump in on that? Thank you, please, Imogen. Um, I don't know what platform you're using, but there'll be a way around it for however you're use, however you're doing it. Um, but get your friends and family to write you reviews um, because that will boost your your business in whatever platform you're you're using it on. It will boost your visibility to other people. So they can use fake names. They can pretend not to be. Uh, people that you know um, but get them to write you nice reviews so that yeah fab thank you Imogen um, there's a similar one from Katty. oh yes please sorry. sorry I just thought I'd add to that as well if you're using something like Etsy to sell your candles just jumping off Imogen's point um, have a little look into like SEO so that's like search engine optimization because that makes a massive difference and also targeting your products um, to the time of year so whether it's Easter 
birthday, if there's not something on or Christmas, you need that in your tagline, like Christmas gift um, or something like that. That's a tip I got from someone at um, Etsy. Fab. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Gailey. Um, so a similar one from um, Katie. Um, what are some tips for getting noticed online other than paying for Facebook, Instagram ads? Maybe James could help us with this one. Um, yeah, to echo Kayla's uh, point, SEO is one of the most important factors to be found online over just social media in general. I think it's also important, you know, for a lot of people, we we try and beat the algorith algorithms on social media constantly. We try and, you know, we listen to things in the grapevine about what's the best thing to do. If you build quality content, you will be found. And I think it's really important that it's not always the best idea to be spending money on ads. But again, I'm really happy if you message me, I will have a look at your accounts for you briefly and see if I can give you any advice in the beginning. Happy to do that for you. Thank you, James. Um, we've got one for, uh, from someone um, on an iPad um, asking, do you need to be fully set up with a website before starting um, to sell your products? I think it depends what you're selling, but generally no. Um, <laughs> if you've got a, a physical product, then you have to find a way to get it in front of customers. Actually, that goes for whatever you're selling. You, you have to find a way to be showing your customers, but it doesn't have to be a website. Um, you can be doing face-to-face -face marketing at networking events, just handing out business cards. You could be doing craft fairs if it's sort of that way relevant. You could be looking at local shops who might stock your product if that's what is relevant to your product. That's great, thank you, Imogen. Um, and Zoe's asking for top tips for designing and selecting your brand, name, colors, mission statement, et cetera. And James has talked to us a lot about branding. Um, do you want to? Yeah, I think Zoe, that's a brilliant question. I think for a lot of people, you know, and I think you've heard it today that a lot of people will run and get things online as quickly as possible. And I think sometimes it's important to kind of reflect on what you want to do you know I do I, I know it's an old school technique but sometimes the best thing I do is I literally just write a mind map what do you you know what are you trying to sell uh, you know what are you trying to achieve from that what is your emotion with that and I think it's sometimes important to kind of do brand workshops on yourself um, you know once we did a brand workshop for ourselves on hot sauce we realized what our ethos and our mission actually was what we were trying to sell and then it started to kind of flow from there I think it's important sometimes not always to look at some of these leading brands out there and go, I really want to be like that. Sometimes it's important to kind of spend some time yourself to understand who you are and what's going to make you different. So sometimes it's important to have that self-brand workshop, take a day out, take half a day, get some paper and literally just start writing down what you're trying to be and who you want to be in the future. I think it's really important to do that. Thank you, James. And Kaylee and Imogen, you both have lovely brands. Did you want to talk to us about them? Um, any tips? Thank you. Go for Imogen. It, <laughs> um, so I, I don't, I'm trying to think how I started. Um, it was just, it was picking out colours that were relevant. I think that was how it started. Um, and actually it was through the, it was while I was doing the boot camp that sort of I really, I had the idea, but I was going through the boot camp to see how to sort of sol solidify that. Um, and it was that that really made me think about what I was trying to convey in my branding. Um, and it was, I uh, a lot of what I did was sort of looking at what was already out there. Similar similar businesses that were doing that, uh, that were sort of relevant in my industry and why those colors worked or why those name formats looked like they did or sounded like they did. Um, yeah. Thank you, Imogen. Anything to add, Kaylee? Just a similar thing, really, kind of a mix of Imogen and James. Like I, I did kind of a thing of what is my business? What am I selling? Um, things like that. And I think a mind map is a really good idea. I did that recently for myself and just was like, what's the five, uh, what's the five things about my business that make it my business? And then you can kind of use that to make social media posts, make products, kind of work everything off that. And that's your brand. Um, but for instance, for the logo itself, I just thought, what's the main colors that I use, which is red? Um, and then what's, um, yeah, what am I selling? What am I doing? Just, yeah, you just kind of have to look at your 
thing and then try and make something and show it to people you know. I'm very lucky my sister's a graphic designer, so I, I could show her stuff and be like, does this make sense, you know? Um, so family and friends are brilliant that way or Facebook groups, things like that, and then just go from there. And I've, I've got one more tip I just thought of while Katie was talking then. Um, make your branding adaptable. Um, so you'll you'll think of a, a logo to start with and a, a name and everything, but different platforms, different social media, different uh, websites and things will want it in a different format or a different shape. So make sure you've got elements you can sort of pull out. I've got mine, for example, for anything that needs a round logo, so Instagram and Facebook. Um, it's the the marble background that I use and then the and sign I've pulled out of the main logo and I use that as a sort of simplistic version. So have things that you can change and you can make it relevant for whatever you're using. Thank you, Imogen. And I think it's really important to protect that, that brand and, and the logos and um, everything that you create, guys. So you um, come and talk to the BIPC team in libraries um, about protecting your brand um, when you get a chance um, or talk to us online. Sorry, Simon, you had something that you wanted to add. Yeah, just to say, talk to your peers and your networks and people you know. Uh, when we uh, did some branding for Win, we actually put it out on our socials and sort of said, vote on this. What do you think? <laughs> And another great way is um, our platform. We have businesses from really early stage right the way up to really established businesses and some specialists on there as well. So you'd be welcome to post the picture of your logo and sort of go, what do you think of this? And the community in a, in a really safe, safe way can join in and sort of go, oh, have you thought of doing this or that or amending it or doing something a bit different? Uh, and you get that feedback and that would be really useful too. Fabulous. Thank you, Simon. Uh, we have time for one more quick question. And uh, before that, I'm just going to launch a final poll, guys. If you can tell us what else you'd like to see from us, that'd be really useful and um, exciting. Um, let me just go back to the question that someone had asked. Um, where was that? Two, two, two. Sorry, so much in the chat, guys. Thank you so much for posting. Thank you for your questions. Um, someone's asking how often you should uh, should you post on social media to help your sales and grow your business. Uh, I'm feeling like that's one for James in particular. <laughs> You're on mute, James. It's a really interesting question. I think actually my answer will be different to Imogen uh, and Kayla, and I think it's actually different to any industry. But I think it's really important sometimes that we get addicted to posting. And we feel like we need to post to our audiences sometimes. And we think, right, I've got to get something out there. I've got to get something out there right now because I haven't posted in a few days. Post important and quality content. And that's the kind of thing that people want to see. You know, don't post, you know, when people say, oh, post filler content just to keep it going. Don't do that because people don't want to see that. What they want to see is quality content. At the end of the day, they're following you because they want to see something enticing. If, it, if it's Kayla, they want to see a, a new product or something that she's working on. If it's Imogen, they want to see those DIY kits and how to use them. If it's me, they want to see some testimonials and what I'm up to. It's important though to impose quality. So you don't always feel like you need to post constantly. Post when you post and plan, that's important and have a strategy, but post when you feel it's necessary. Lovely. Thank you so much, James. And I think we're going to close on that. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you to Angelica, who's uh, a student. She's on the call today. She um, did a placement with the BIPC and supported us in putting this event together. So huge thank you to you, Angelica. And thank you very much, everyone, for um, coming today. Um, thank you to our lovely panelists, um, our lovely business support providers. And thank you very much, Jack, for um, holding it all together. Um, this was really fantastic. Um, we I will be sharing everyone's contact details. Please do get in touch. We are all friendly people. So yeah, come, come and talk to us and approach us if you don't know what to do next. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. I hope it was useful and we'll see you all soon, hopefully. Take care. Have a hey lovely guys. day. Bye, bye, bye guys. Have a nice weekend. Bye everyone.